Welcome back to the Hoops Temple Podcast. You all know me, Nathan Schwartz. And joining me, D Lee 43, David, Hawks fan. David, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm looking forward to talking today. Good. David, I wanted to have you on. I saw you responding into my co host, Aaron's uh, initial prognostication is top 100 on Trey Young. And as an outside observer, I don't quite know what to make of Trey Young because in 2021, the Hawks made the Eastern Conference Finals, and I know there was some up and down with Trey Young. Since then, you've had a head coach change. We've had a kind of failed front office tenure. We've had different players come and go. Where are you at with Trey? Is he a superstar? Is he someone that you want to try to continue to build around? Yeah, I mean, I think he's definitely someone we still want to keep building around. I think the the title of superstar is something that I personally reserve for uh, – players that I believe can be um, an offensive engine for a contender, right? So in my opinion, there's only maybe seven to eight superstars in the NBA. Now, I would have um, a tier below that, and some of that is to deal with um, his limitations as a okay. defender and some of the other offensive inefficiencies that he needs to clean up, whether it's an efficiency at the rim or some of the shot profile stuff that just needs to be a little bit better. Um, but it's, I think it's absolutely fair to be a little bit skeptical about him coming off this last season. Um for me, it's like I pay so much attention to Hawks games, right? And so I dig into, okay, what's what's contributing to this on-court product, right? And it's it's really interesting because when you look at his minutes without DeJounte, uh, they were a plus 6.5 with a net rating. Like that's a that's a really sizable difference as opposed to their negative 6.8, I believe, mm -hmm. with both of them on the court. So not an indictment on DeJounte as a player and not an indicator that Trey is exceptionally better than him, but just more so how bad the fit was between the both of them. And so I think it's it's tough to evaluate him as an individual player when the product of the team hasn't been great. Um, but I do think this season you're going to see a resurgence. You're going to see a little bit more respect for him just because um, there's a little bit of addition by subtraction. But just in general, what the front office has done this particular offseason makes a lot more sense and is a lot more conducive to contributing to that style of play that we're going to need from him if we're going to eventually build a contender. So what then is a good pairing for Trey Young? Because in my mind, I would have thought DeJounte Murray would be a great pairing, you know, having this defensive guard next to an offensive engine. Both guys can ball handle, both guys can score. And I thought moving Trey off ball a little bit would be helpful for the team as a whole. It doesn't seem like that worked out well. Yeah, so I mean, when you look at the numbers, uh, there was a, a pretty decent move in terms of off-ball actions. Uh, there wasn't nearly enough off-ball screens that I would have liked to see, especially with Bogdanovich on the floor as well. Um, but the thing is, in theory, yes, DeJounte is a great fit with Trey. But the issue is he was never really the defender that was advertised. Um, even in San Antonio, he's more so like I always liken him to someone like Trayvon Diggs. So Trayvon Diggs, he's a great playmaking cornerback, right? He's going to get a ton of interceptions. He's going to mm. he's going to force a lot of uh, sort of transition plays as a result of his defensive acumen. But when it comes to actually stopping a player at the point of attack, he doesn't necessarily have the facilities to do that. And it's not just a skill set thing. It's not just everything, but it's just a frame. Like DeJounte is 6'4", 6'5", but he's 180 pounds. So you can't put him on these bigger guards. You can't put him on these wings. And when the Hawks already have all these other weak points on defense, it just compounded itself. So, yes, in theory, DeJounte is a defensive player that you want next to Trey, but they actually went and got that actual player in Dyson Daniels, in my opinion. Now, Dyson's offense, of course, like especially as a sub-creator, isn't anywhere near DeJounte, but his defensive ability, he's a top-10 perimeter defender. Um, and the fact that he was still tasked with guarding some of the best defenders in the NBA with Herb Jones on that team sort of just speaks to what type of level defender he is. And so I'm really optimistic to see his fit next to Trey because we've seen guys like DeLon Wright excel next to him as well. I do really like Dyson Daniels, especially because I feel like he makes smart, quick moves. He doesn't hold the ball. It's a little bit like Lonzo right. Ball a few years back where if it, if it touches mm -hmm. him, you know, he might not get the assist, but he's going to keep it moving. The lack of shooting is a little bit of a worry, but, you know, if you put him out there with Bogdan and Trey, there's there's scoring potential out there. Right. And that's the interesting so, thing, too. Like, I know you want to talk about, um, start, not to cut you off, but I know you want to talk about the no, starting lineups. And and so one thing that Hawks fans are obsessed with is just, okay, is reason shaking the start? Is reason shaking the start? They're like, no, which number one picks don't start? Like, they're, they're, they're always pointing the bus. In my opinion, starting lineups don't matter nearly as much as one may think. And the mm -hmm. thing that's really, really important for the Hawks this season is these past two seasons, it had to be trained to Jante starting, not just from a politics standpoint, but you don't give up 
three first round picks for a player and then bench them, even though that was the only way to make them work. Right. It just doesn't work right for that locker room. You didn't make that promise to DeJounte to, you know, to go and trade for him and then bring him off the bench. But now they have options. They have optionality. They have versatility. And that's really exciting because, OK, maybe when we're playing a more def- a, a team that we need to be more defensive inclined, let's start Dyson. Let's put Dyson out there against Boston. Let's put him out there against Cleveland. Let's put him out there against Philly to handle Tyrese Maxey. But when you're playing a team that you don't necessarily need a stopper to start the game off, then let's put Bogey out there. Let's 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 start really strong offensively and then we can tinker throughout the game. And we didn't have that option. We haven't had that option for a while. We haven't really had a point of attack guy since the lawn, right? Um, so the, the starting lineups, I think will fluctuate. I think it'll be completely malleable, but I would say, I, I think Reza Shea has the chance to do something similar to what Derek Lively did, which is, you know, start the season coming off the bench and eventually make his way into the starting lineup. Just because if his, he's 6'10", right? And he's got really good mm-hmm. feet. But it's the frame, because if he gets bullied, which is probably what's going to happen the first couple of months, if not his entire rookie year, then he can't be out there with Shay. Just That's just the reality. But as he grows and gets a little bit more comfortable in the NBA, I think you could see him enter that starting lineup. But until right now, I think it's really just going to be Trey, um, either Bogey or Dyson. You're going to start Hunter, uh, Jalen Johnson. And then in my pick would be Onyeka Okongwu. So I was curious about Onyeka Okongwu. Because I loved him coming into the draft. I thought Mm -hmm. that he was um, just a super high defensive IQ type of guy, potential. His NBA career has left me a little bit um, worried. I feel like he's a lot smaller against the NBA product than what I was expecting. You know, college guys always just look bigger because there's no one big in college. Um, So I didn't didn't anticipate him looking this small in the pros. Also, everyone lies about their height. So I I feel like I never, never fully know how tall guys are until they get to the pros. But... Do you think he's big enough to really hold down the five? Or do you think it's kind of a, a Draymond Green situation where you can put him at five for mm. minutes, but maybe not the full-time starter? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because I was I was in the locker room because um, I, I sort of function as a reporter as well. And I I was just standing there next to him. I was like, he looks closer to 6'8 to me. And mm-hmm. the only – if this was a team that had a 6'3 point guard, a 6'7 shooting guard um, – that would be fine. Now, the thing is, the Hawks have been small across positions the past two years. In 2022, 2023, we were the lightest roster. We were the lightest roster, and we were the fourth or fifth smallest. And, tw- and then the following year, we were still pretty light. I think we were around like eighth or tenth, and we got a little bit taller, right? So that helped us a lot with like Sadiq Bey playing the four because he's a bigger body. He can rebound. Now, the biggest issue with Onyeka isn't his size like on one-on-one. Like, he's, he performs really well against Giannis and Bede. He can hold his own. He's super strong, super mobile. It's the rebounding. And yeah. the rebounding has consistently been an issue for him, but that's why you have someone like Jalen Johnson next to him. Because Jalen Johnson is 6'10", uber athletic, loves to rebound the glass and push the ball up in transition. And so they really make together they make sense together as a combo. Um, I spoke a little bit earlier about how there's addition by subtraction with the John St. Murray leaving the team. And I'm proposing that same theory for Clint Capella. So when we traded for Capella, it was it was a big move for us because we didn't have an anchor for Trey. And that 2021 season, he was absolutely that like top five and protector. He's still a voracious offensive rebounder, but he just isn't the same level offensive or defensive player he was. Like so I'll hit you with some numbers, but in the minutes he played with Trey Young, he shot 68 percent at the rim. In the minutes without him, he shot 57 percent. He shot, and so over that Ooh. extrapolated across that sample, right? That's a massive drop. Extrapolated across that sample, he had the second lowest field goal percentage of any player six ten or higher. Only Jaron Jackson was worse. And we know how Jaron Jackson can be around the rim. So you don't want to be in that company. So just think about the mm-hmm. amount of valuable possessions we're leaving on the board because Clint Capella can't finish at the rim. And there's like I have a whole compilation of just him just missing bunnies. Like like a lot of Hawks fans would just be like, bunny missing Clint. That's what they call him. And that's just that's what he's become, unfortunately. And then the defensive drop off is the issue as well, because in general, the Hawks defense hasn't been great. Last season, we switched to a different scheme. And so this was the most blitz heavy scheme that the NBA has seen. And I think since tracking data started, I think we were blitzing on over 16 or 17 percent of possessions. And so what happens is when you're bringing the, the center up to the ball, the weak side defenders, whether it's Sadiq Bay or DeAndre Hunter, they didn't have the size, first off, but they also didn't have the positioning to effectively defend against backdoor cuts or defend against the short against the roller. The Sadiq Bay would have he would have his back to his man and not have his back to the sideline. And so you, we were getting back cut to death. We gave up more c- points off cuts than any team ever to start the season for the first 40 or so games. So when you adjust to a different defensive scheme, both Onyeka and Clint were hurt. 
But Onyeka has mm-hmm. the actual skill set to be able to move around in a scheme like that. And if that's the scheme, and here's the other thing too. Dyson's presence is really important for Clinton as well because now you can go back to that drop coverage where he's more comfortable. We couldn't run drop coverage with the guys we had on the floor because DeJounte can't get over screens. Trey can get over, but he's not much resistance. But now you've got a 6'8", 200-pound, elite perimeter defender. Like I, When I watch the tape, I'm just so much encouraged because he can hold up against guys like LeBron. But he's quick enough to, like, to, to stay with someone like Kyrie. So there's a lot more optionality that could make Capella a little bit more feasible. But I think the offensive upside with Onyeka, just it, that alone would have me wanting him starting. I mean, he's a much better uh, – he functions much better in dribble handoff scenarios. He can – a little bit of fake dribble handoffs. Um, he had the fourth – A little bit of a three-point touch. Yeah, yeah. It, and the three-point touch is not, growing too. It, it, it's growing there. I, I mm-hmm. sorry to cut in, but I just no, you I like what you said there about Dyson Daniels, those wingspan. And you can see a lot of a bit of that with Risa Shea as well. Mm-hmm. But, you know, just having these guys on the perimeter with high IQ, long wingspan, that's going to make it easier on whoever is the starting center, whether that be Capella or or um or Onyeka Kangwu. Just hey, if they're coming up on a blitz, having those guys who can kind of get in the lane you know, take away some of the passing lanes or weak side rim protection. Not that either of those guys you want to be your like primary rim protection. Right. But just just to be able to get over there. I've um I've been talking with some Bucks folks about what to expect for or Lillard this year. And I'm like, it's a really tough thing having Lillard and Lopez, because Lopez mm. needs to be drop coverage. The man is 37 years old. He can't get up. And and you can't expect Lillard to learn how to fight through screens at 34 years old. But with the Hawks, you got a young crew that if you wanted to switch up your schemes to something a little bit more modern, a little bit more aggressive, this is probably the right time to do it and the right, you know, crew of guys right. to make that work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, that's what I'm excited about because guys are a little bit younger, which means I think one thing like this gets lost with um, the NBA in general is like sort of the politics of like veterans getting minutes. And so mm-hmm. there was a, there was an aspect of fans where it was like, okay, like we need some veteran leadership or whatever, like, uh, but they need to lean into getting a little bit younger because that's the only way you're going to sustainably build a contender. If you look at the East mm-hmm. right now, Boston's going to have a monopoly for the next two to three-ish years. They've got a lot of guys on a contract for a good amount of time. Um, and then so you, you need to be building to contend within two to three years as opposed to trying to contend now. Um, so any move that they took to do that, I was in favor of. <clears throat> I was also kind of interested in Brandon Ingram because I thought that he could be a transitional mm-hmm. piece that could complement Trey Young. But I didn't want to give it too much. Like, if it was going to be DeJounte and then Brandon Ingram came back, I was cool with that. But I love Dyson Daniels as well. So um, it's, it's a, the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway, I would say, from the Hawks uh, offseason and just in general, the outlook going into the season is that they're a lot more versatile. they got a lot more length. They've got a lot more optionality. And that's just super, super important. And this year, in this type of NBA landscape, like, you can't play a single style of basketball. A Trey's the best pick and roll creator in the NBA. He's led them in, He's led the NBA in pick and roll points generated per game. For five straight seasons, he has the record for most ever, 30.3 points per game. That's like a fail safer off. Like if you need a good offensive look, run a trade pick and roll. He's going to make something happen. But you cannot sustainably do that for an entire playoff series or even a playoff run. Mm-hmm. Like we saw it. You mentioned the 2021 run. Even when we got all the way to the conference finals, in hindsight, it was very clear that they needed offensive help. But they decided to run it back. And then he got exposed. Well, I'll say exposed. He got exposed in the 2022 Miami playoff series because Miami realized nobody else can beat us. Let's just load up on him, be super physical, because we don't trust anyone else to initiate. And so that's why they overreacted with DeJounte. So it's been this domino effect of bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. But now they've got a little bit more of a cleaner slate. They're gonna, I think they're going to be a little bit more sustainable, a little bit more patient. Um, and that's why I feel like from the addition, with the, from this addition due to subtraction, right, but then just in general, just a more cohesive team that fits the identity that Quinn Snyder wants to run. This team's going to be better than next year, than, uh, than they were last year for sure. Yeah. I uh, I think another thing that went wrong was bumping Bogey, not, not quite back in the rotation because he was the sixth man before you got Murray. I, right. I kept feeling like he was ready to start. And his presence, he moves the ball quickly. It's it's like the Dyson Daniels. It's 0.5 seconds. Catch, let me move it. Um and I felt like when you did Murray and Trey out there, there was a lot of your turn, my turn. Let me ISO or let me, you know, pound the rock, call for the, the screen, call for the pick and roll. Bogey is comfortable playing on or off ball. And it just, it moves much better out there. So I really do hope he gets the starting spot. I could see him being the sixth man because you want to go a little bit more offense in the second unit, a little more defense up front. 
Um, but th- that's interesting to hear. I did not know that Trey Young was the number one pick and roll guy over the last five years. Yeah, he has the record for most pick and roll points ever created since I think Synergy goes back to 2004. So we're talking prime Steve Nash as well. Um, right. So like there, there's never we've never seen this much volume. Even last year, like he has he was number one again, but he had his efficiency was on par with everyone else in the top five. So as a as a scorer, sometimes, yes, his efficiency can be a little bit, you know, you might leave a little bit more to be desired. But when you include the playmaking, there's, he's really unparalleled mm-hmm. as a creator. Right. So it means that means that when you're putting guys around him, as you've touched on multiple times, like the decisions have to be quicker. It can't be. OK, I, I caught the ball. There's a closeout. I'm going to hold it. Pump fake. No, no. Like, keep the ball moving. Keep it moving. And that's why guys who can do more than one thing, like dribble, pass, shoot. That's Riza Shea, Dyson, Anyeka Kongu, Jalen Johnson, Bogdan Bogdanovich. Like, those are the types of guys who are going to be getting those swing passes. So I, I expect the offense to be better. I expect the defense to be better. And then just by those marginal improvements, I didn't even talk about Sadiq Bey. Like, I could keep talking about Sadiq Bey because he was the worst corner three-point shooter for like I I went and looked back. It's, I think I went back to two thousand and hold on, I gotta pull this up. I think it was two thousand and two. Like we've never seen a yeah, yeah. I went back to two thousand one. He shot twenty nine point nine percent on hundred and seventy seven corner threes, which was nine percentage points worse than league average. And that's the worst relative corner three point shooting season of any player who took high volume corner threes. So just to paint a picture of all these offensive inefficiencies, and they were still a top eleven offense. So, so you're that, saying that, I should sell? You're, you're saying I should sell my Sadiq Bay stock? He's not going to be anything ever. Uh, it's it's I that wasn't who he was. Like up until that particular point in the season, Sadiq was a, a like a phenomenal three point shooter. When we traded for him, like mid season, he was great for us. But for whatever reason, I think what, the biggest thing for me, I think he bulked up to be a four because we needed him to play mm-hmm. the four. And a lot of times when guys add muscle, ah, it's just tough, especially from the corner. You have a lot less give. You don't have a backboard. Um, and I think as he hit that slump, it just got worse and worse and worse. Um, to his credit, like he would always make up for it. Super hard worker, grinds on mm-hmm. the glass, would finish strong around the rim. Uh, but that that killed us. You can't do that and have Clint Capella be awful around the rim and have DeJounte and Trey be a terrible pairing. So we were doomed. Like there, there was this mathematically there was no way that we could make the playoffs playing that type of basketball. So I think they addressed their three biggest inefficiencies. If they, well, I don't think they'll trade Capella, but if Capella comes off the bench, I think they've addressed their three biggest inefficiencies. So then let's talk about the potential starting front court. Um, where do you want to start? Jalen Johnson or, or uh, DeAndre Hunter? Because one's a positive conversation. One's not. Yeah. 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 Um, Let's start positive, man. I feel like, and Jalen is, like, I love Jalen. I love everything about him. I love the way that he approaches the game. I love the way he plays. Like, I think he's – the way he attacks the rim in transition is, like – it's, like, reminiscent of early LeBron. And I don't say that to be, like, as a hyperbole. Like, he has that same power and, like, ferocity, like, just tearing down the lane in transition. And I think that's something that the Hawks, for whatever reason, like, we have a great passer in Trey Young, but we've never really been a great transition scoring team because guys don't get out and run. Like, John Collins was never really a guy who would get out and run, DeAndre Hunter. Um, so mm-hmm. that's a big element for our offense. And then now I think he's a super we- – like he's a huge weapon in the short role. He's a huge weapon in transition. Now it's like, okay, what can you do as a creator? Um, one thing that was a little bit infuriating with him, he's 6'10", super athletic, but he always wants to like, – let's say he drops to the basket, he's turning his, bas- his, his back, and he's trying to fade over his shoulder. Now he was really good at those shots. I think he was 80th, 88th percentile on mid-range shots, but, you know, on lower volume. But I want to see him get all the way to the rim a little bit more. His half-court scoring leaves a little bit to be desired. You know, he's still a bigger guy, so he dribbles upright. Um, he doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily uh, create as well for himself, especially with Trey off the floor. Um, but I think he has everything he needs to be, like, a super, super impactful player on both ends. And I think there's a there's sort of a, a gift of usage that's going to be dispersed between him and Bogdan Bogdanovich. So it's, okay, now we're going to give you a little bit more responsibility. What can you do with this? I think Hawks fans kind of see him as a little bit more of a creator than I do. Like, I think he's realistically maybe a third best player on a, on a contending team just because of his complementary skills. Like, I think he's a tertiary, tertiary creator right now. But he has flashes of that secondary playmaking where he's catching the ball in the short roll, he's throwing lobs, or he's throwing lobs from half court, or he's throwing these really nice bounce passes. So I don't want to mm-hmm. discount what he could be, but I do think – we're going to see him figure it out a little bit more in the half court before I can say, okay, this is going to be the, the guy that we're going to pair with Trey. I think he's always going to be paired with Trey long-term if that's the goal, but maybe we need to go get another guy to compliment both of them as opposed to let's get someone to compliment. Let's get someone to play behind him offensively. If that makes sense. 
Yeah, that makes sense. And it's it's good to hear kind of a relatively uh, moderate perspective on him as opposed to the, yes, he's absolutely going to be our second star. He's going to grow and he's going to be, you know, an all-star this year mm-hmm. and all-NBA next year. And I feel like you hear that from some fans of teams. Uh, last offseason, actually, I should say, most offseasons, when we do the pod, we talk about who we think is going to win most improved with this next year. And a thing that I always like to do is look at guys playing 15 minutes or less that I think can really grow. And my pick last year was Jalen Johnson during the offseason to be an all, be an all ah, to be an all improved guy or right. most improved player. Or so I was super happy to see his growth and development, but I don't I, I don't see it again this year. I've been seeing um, some of the preliminary top hundreds coming out from different guys. And I, I I think he might be he had that jump, but I think he might be a little bit closer to the ceiling than um than it looks like people are expecting it looks like people are expecting kind of a second leap and for me if there was going to be a second leap i think it's going to be more on the defensive end for him mm. i mean he is incredibly athletic he has great motor and wingspan what do you think of his potential to be an all defensive type of guy this season yeah i think he i think he can but it's more so the type of player that he defends really well against is sort of scarce in the nba so because he's not like for example, KD, obviously a freak of like a freak of nature in terms of his mm-hmm. wingspan and even the way he can flip his hips. Sometimes Jalen's really upright. Like he, in general, he's a very upright player. That's whether he dri- he's dribbling or playing defense. So he can, mm-hmm. he isn't always low enough to contain drives or contain faster players. That's why I think he's better against someone like a like he's at his best against someone like Randall. Even if Randall's a little bit stronger than him, but like more so of a, a more of a pace player as opposed to a quick burst player. I mean. And the thing is, as the league is evolving, those four men, those three men are going to be a lot quicker than they used to be. And so mm-hmm. I think for him to reach an all defensive level, he's going to have to be able to contain guys off the dribble a little bit better. Um, I think as a weak side defender, like we mentioned with the rim protection with, with someone like Reza Shea, mm-hmm. he's, he's very capable of that. And he's very good at cleaning up rebounds. And I think that's like that's an underrated defensive skill, especially from a four man. But I think he's more of an Aaron Gordon defender as opposed to like a... Um, I'm trying to think of like a, a versatile for like maybe like a Siakam. Like Siakam was was a guy that you'd be like, okay, I'm I'm super comfortable with someone switching onto Siakam out of pick and roll. I feel like he can contain almost anyone mm-hmm. be- just because of the way his frame is. And it, the other thing about Siakam, he plays really low. So that's the type of thing I want Jalen to sort of lean into a little bit before I can say, all right, maybe he can be in all. The- I think yeah, again, like all the tools, but it's just I think it's more of a technique thing for him because to contain these lower these quicker guys, you have to be a little bit. It's more solid with your with your technique. Like if you watch Bam against, he's not sti- he's not sitting upright against someone like Trey mm-hmm. who's quicker than him. He's he's sitting down. He's he's using mm-hmm. his length to contain. And that's something I feel like like to be fair to Jalen, he didn't really have a rookie season. Like Nate McMillan's a terrorist. He didn't want to play him, and so he he didn't get any run in the G League either. So like he's still a little bit with these like so more raw. like positional things, you know? Like yeah, like and so I think he can get there hundred percent. He definitely can get there. Yeah. Um, but. Yeah, I just need to see it. I I liked what he did defending guys of his own position. Him going up against yep. Apollo, going up against the Giannis. Yeah, Apollo is a good was, example. Uh, but I, I guess I I didn't see too many switches, and I guess that probably explains why they probably wanted to keep him at home a bit more. Or if you're seeing mm-hmm. that uh, the lack of getting low, so not a Jared Vanderbilt, not a Jaden McDaniels type, but a guy who could still will be good against his own position. That's uh, right. See, this is why I try to bring on guys who watch their own team a ton of times. I I have my spreadsheets. I try to watch every team 10 to 20 mm-hmm. times each season, uh, 20 for playoff teams, 10 for, you know, the the play in or less. This, but you can't get a full, full deep dive into everyone. There's too many games. We got we to turn yes. down the season so I can watch every game. I was going to say, though, that was a great pick for Jalen for, for most improved, like, like across the board, like no, I think he was second in points per game jump, first in rebounds, and then first in assists. So, like by the I, numbers, most improved. So I wanted it. I mm-hmm. I'm I'm sick of most improved going to who guys that you, you kind of expect it. Like I guess I would have been fine with Kobe White because I didn't see Kobe White coming at all. I thought that he was overrated and wasn't going to go anywhere. It was going. Yeah. I mean, maybe not wash out of the league, but it was going to be like in the next D'Angelo Russell or something closer to that than having that leap maxi you kind of saw coming and but uh, I, I was listening to a zach low pod and the, the guest is like i'm not excited for when we start having the most improved conversation about victor Wimbanyama. and they're like oh it's gonna be bad like 
Oh. All right. Then the other front court forward that's expected to start, DeAndre Hunter. I. What do you like about him? What, what as a player is exciting? Why is he still get minutes? Why is he continue to be in the rotation? Mm-hmm. Continue to get these checks. I think Hunter is like a a sunk cost fallacy in terms of we invested a lot of money into him. We had, first off from the from the rip we invested a lot into him. We traded up for him mm-hmm. um, for that fourth pick, and even then you could see like we I spoke about how the regime sort of like fell in love with that iteration of the team, but. They they understood they needed size, toolsy wings around trade. They got mm-hmm. Cam Reddish. They got DeAndre Hunter. They didn't work out. Okay, Cam didn't work out. They moved on. Hunter didn't work out, and they extended him. So that was like I think it was more so of an admission that they don't want to say, okay, we messed up. And the other thing is Hunter is really frustrating because he has these stretches where he's phenomenal. In the month mm-hmm. of February, he came off the bench. He averaged 17 points on 60 plus true shooting. No, 69. He was he was almost at 72 yeah. shooting percentage for the entire month. That's only been done by three other guys. I think it was Austin Reeves, um, James Harden, and I forgot the other guy, but like another notable six man of the year. So when he was in that, like it was okay, this is a different dude. And the what what really told me it was a different dude is Hunter is not a decisive player. We mentioned the whole dribble pass shoot. He was mm-hmm. driving closeouts and dunking up people. I was like, I don't know who this dude is, but this is not who we drafted. And so if, if when he plays that way, okay, I, you know, I might drink the copium. I'll be like, okay, well, if he can do this consistently, then I get it. But the issue is he's never done it consistently. He's never – and some of that, like even his 2021 season when we made that run, he got hurt. That was his best stretch of basketball. Like he was really, really good that season. I think he only played like about 20 or so games. So um, this particular season, hilariously, like I think Quinn Snyder got career seasons out of everyone somehow, and we still missed the playoffs. But – for example, DeAndre Hunter had his highest true shooting of his career. He was at 60%. And that's pretty good for someone who's taken a lot of mid-range jumpers. Um, he, he had the highest three-point attempts of his career as well. And I think, like, he was at six and a half. And he's never really been over five. So that, that sort of there's... gives you the idea of it. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Do you think there's something to having him come off the bench more? I, I, just... I think mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. contextually. I think it is. He, like... You know, going up against starters, most teams play their best players as starters. Most teams have a good wing defender in their starting lineup that maybe they don't have on the bench. And I, I, there's something about it being easier against going against bench units just that may unlock him. Yeah, yeah. I think that's definitely a fair point. And like what jumps out to me as well is his percentage of shots at the rim that were assisted spiked like, like by 16% from last mm-hmm. season. So that tells you that he's making quicker decisions and then. I think for him, he needs his role to be defined. Like, okay, we're going to put the ball in your hands, just go score, as opposed to we need you to space the floor for Trey or DeJounte. And so I don't know if spacing is his role, even if he is. I mean, he's a decent three-point shooter. Like, for his career, he, it won't wow you. But last year, he was on at 38.5%. So mm-hmm. it's the health. It's a combination of the health, the role sometimes being a little bit murky for him. And, but the defensive stuff is the most frustrating because – this is a guy who was, like, amazing at Virginia. He was so good at Virginia. Well, f- well, actually, I love Ryan Dunn. So, like, I watched Ryan Dunn a lot, and I really thought he'd be I- – I can't wait to watch him. But I was so hurt from DeAndre Hunter that I'm like, I don't even want us to take him because it's something about Virginia wings. Uh, but my point is he was really, really good def- – like, he was unbelievably great defensively at Virginia. And so we were all expecting – I mean, he had Kawhi Leonard comps. He had, like, all these, like, okay, big yeah. wings who can stop guys. That's not who he is. What he is is because he, he doesn't he doesn't create deflections. He doesn't create steals. He doesn't create blocks. So he's not disruptive at all. He's just a solid defender, but he can't contain guys faster than him, and he's not big enough to contain guys stronger than him. So the only guys he defends really well are guys like Luca. Like, again, sort of like the same thing as Jalen, where it's like a pace-heavy guy. Um, but if you're asking him to stick a guard, it's not going to look good. Wait, wait, wait. I don't, I don't think we could talk about him containing guys like Luca very well after that 70 point performance so I mean, just, hunter didn't play that which, game which oh true he didn't play I that know game. Jalen Johnson so, played that one and uh and he that's was getting cooked in yes, bad ways. and that's yep and that's the reason because like i can still sort of we we call him a luca stopper like just to mess with Mavs fans but he is mm-hmm. probably one of the best luca defenders in the nba if i was a western conference team like i would i would almost be a little bit intrigued to be like okay what can we get DeAndre? because i would assume deandre hunter's value is like nowhere near how much you would imagine. So it'd be like, okay, could I maybe get DeAndre Hunter for something cheap? Because I, he really is great at defending someone like Luca, but that's like the only type of guy he can defend. And so that doesn't give us a lot of options. Like there's, there's not a lot of pace heavy, bigger wings 
Like mm-hmm. even someone like Jalen Brown, he struggles against. Um, he's mm-hmm. a little bit better against like a power wing, but that's just not the type of guy that when we have Trey, who we need to hide on someone and we need someone to step up and take the guard, it can't be Hunter. And that's the biggest issue. So, so what I'm hearing you say is you should bring him off the bench. We should start Reese You got Jet Hansen, you got a Kongwu starting in Bogdan and uh, Trey. Sounded like a pretty decent team. What's your overall expectation for what a successful season would look like for the Hawks this year? Yeah, I think that's a. I think we have to. I think for Trey's from Trey's perspective. And just in general, like the way he's received around the league, the Hawks can't continue to be a bad team. And so like the line between bad and like middling is sort of blurred in the Eastern Conference because I think a lot of people have a pretty solidified top four. And then there's sort Mm -hmm. of like a, okay, we've got like some of the younger teams like Orlando and Indiana. And we got some of the older teams like Miami. Okay, where does everyone slot in? I don't think Hawks fans want to see another playing like appearance, if I'm going to be honest. But um, I think like anywhere north of 45 wins would probably be a success just considering the, the amount of young guys we have playing now for them to reach that like i think i i definitely think i'm going to break 500 that's this is what from the way i looked at the numbers like this is they had generationally bad luck shooting corner threes they had a horrible finisher around the rim they had a terrible inefficiency at guard spots cool that's that alone like if they can get the same level of play that dyson daniels gave new orleans if Bogdan Bogdanovich can play the way that you even was in the Olympics as a secondary creator, if you get a little bit more from Jalen Johnson, that should be at least five wins. So I, I feel like over 500 isn't crazy. Um, but from mm-hmm. my perspective, like I think success is my level of success is going to be different from like other Hawks fans. Hawks fans are probably going to want to see it's like make a playoff run. I just want to see like Reza Shea be in contention for rookie of the year. I want to see him get comfortable because he's gonna, like his development is going to be super important. I want to see Jalen Johnson develop as a half court scorer. I want to see Trey lean into playing off the ball. I think he has a like a, a chance to put up some stupid numbers this year, but I want to see him like really lean into okay, how can I unlock these other parts of my game with a gifted passer and ball handler like Jalen Johnson next to me? And I want to see Onyeka like get a little bit back to that more defensive anchor that he was in the past. Like I have a more so like individualized idea of success for each player because I don't think the mm-hmm. team, I don't think the team is like a lot of times you just have a younger team. It's just like a, a, a like a you know it's just like a barrier. Okay, your younger team, you're not going to be able to make a stupid run, but I just want to see these guys like get more comfortable in their role so that down the line we can be like, okay, now we can make these runs because guys got these minutes. So sorry about that. I don't really think it's a no. uh like a concrete thing, you know? That's that's why I asked of like what does successful look like what does success look like to you for this team? Like as because like not every team's out here trying to win the championship. Like is making the playoffs successful is is having these like benchmarks for different guys, having Risa Shea look like he deserves to be a starter, not just is one because he's the number one pick, but like actually looks like he belong. Is that successful? If it is, like that that's good. That's that's what I wanted to hear. Um I I don't encourage betting on this. I do pull up the betting lines. Um sports betting can can get wonky, but I pulled yep. up the betting lines. The Hawks are projected by Bet MGM to win 35 and a half games. And it sounds like you're smashing the over on this. This, uh, not from a betting standpoint, but just from a belief in what these Hawks can be being above yeah. 500. Yeah, easily. I'm like, I'm, I'm very bullish. Like, that's a disrespectful number to me. And I think it's because people don't really realize how bad, like, they see DeJounte leaving for Dyson and they see the talent disparity as opposed to what that's going to do for the fit. And that's, that's, that's a fair way to look at it. Like, this team is objectively less talented without DeJounte, like, honestly. But there was such an issue with the fit that it, the, the talent disparity is sort of, bridged by the fact that they're going to be a much better on-court product because everyone fits together a little bit more seamlessly. So I think that's going to translate to more wins. I think they're going to break 40. Like I, w- I would even bet, I would probably do it up to 40. That's just, you know, but obviously I'm going to be a little bit more optimistic than most people, but even like as I'm, I'm building out these yeah. models, I'm building out my predictions for this season and I, I see them getting at least 40 wins for sure. Uh, you mentioned addition by subtraction multiple times, but Giving Bogdanovich more run will help. Uh, Vic Crinchy at the end of the season was found money. He's my yep. new favorite hawk. Um, you know, giving him a more solid role in the rotation. And then the, the interesting thing about the Hawks is despite losing three guys that, I mean, two and a half. Uh, AJ, AJ Griffin, he's not really a guy, but Sadiq Bey and DeJounte Murray were both starters for most of the year. Mm-hmm. Despite losing the two of them, the Hawks are still kind of crazy deep. Like, at the center position, you got Capella, uh, um, Akongwu, 
Cody Zeller, Larry Nance Jr., maybe some of them play the four a little bit. You could go double big with a Kongwu and Capella. I, I don't love it for first smaller lineups, but you got some versatility. Crenchy, be DeAndre Hunter, like Gary Bird, Garrison Matthews is <laughs> right, the right. third string shooting guard. Like, like the, the Hawks have some depth to withstand a little bit of injuries. Is so as long as the roster and the rotation comes together a little bit better than last season, I don't think 500 is outside the realm of possibility. Yeah, and I think that's a fair way to look at it. There's a lot of depth across the board, and so it is going to be interesting to see how the rotation shakes out. Um, generally, when teams lose two starters and don't replace them with you know, solidified other starters from other teams, you're going to see a, a drop-off. Um, but you know, as we touched on throughout the pod, I think it's going to be a different type of replacement in terms of these guys fit better as a cohesive unit. And that's going to mm-hmm. be the biggest thing. And then, but I think you also mentioned it earlier, like I think Reza Shea looking like he belongs is really important for this Hawks team because this number one pick, like this, this is a transformative draft. This was a transformative draft for us. Like I, I was a big star guy. Um, so it didn't, I couldn't even like in, in good faith laugh at him in the summer league. Like I was still doing it just because uh, you know, the whole thing with him, I wanted to come here, which actually really interestingly, just as a tangent, but, it was reported that he didn't want to come to Atlanta, but he actually refused to work out with Houston as well. That just wasn't reported. Hmm. So it, Washington was his destination. It wasn't a particular issue with Atlanta. That's just the way it was framed. So yeah. the way he performed in summer league would, would, would make you feel like, okay, maybe this, they didn't, you know, maybe he wasn't the guy number one, but the versatility is all that really mattered to me, like, especially with his defensive ability. So Reza Shade looking like he belongs is important for this team going forward, but also just the way that this franchise is viewed because we made a lot of really bad mistakes in our history. Like I did a whole YouTube video and my intro was just detailing all the horrible things the Hawks have done. We traded away Bill Russell. We traded away Paul Gasol. We took Marvin Williams over Chris Paul. Like the list just goes on and on and on. And this can't like this, this city is not that we can't take another one of those, you know? And I think the great thing about Reza Shade is that his floor is relatively high, you know, like, at the very least, he's going to be a great shooter and a t- good team defender. But if he reaches his ceiling, which I think is a lot higher than people are advertising, then you've really got a great pick at number one. And I've been saying, like, we kind of got our own, like, Walmart version of Jalen and Jason because that's the type of versatility, toolsy wings. But you have a, a point guard who ties them all together. It took them a long time because they couldn't create for one another. It's that same thing where, like, you've got positional overlap. It's really hard to create advantages for each other. If Jalen screens mm-hmm. for Jason... It's a marginal advantage for the most part. But when you have someone who it. it all together, right, or guys who are a little bit more comfortable off the ball, like Reza Shea is already inclined to be, or they've got a little bit different frames or different positions, then I think you've got something. And so they need him to hit, but they need him to look like he belongs, I think, if they want to make any sort of sizable improvement from last year. They're going to be better, but if they want to get like a 5-10 game improvement, it's going to be on Reza Shea's development and Jalen Johnson's development. And also Dyson as an offensive player because you said you loved him. I love him too. Like he's absolutely incredible to watch as a defender, but he's really hesitant as an offensive player. And that's with the ball in his hands. And that's with him mm-hmm. catching the ball off the catch. So like they need him to be way more assertive with the type of player he is. And the great thing is that's what he looked like in the Olympics. Like I didn't see a ton of tenderness. I didn't see him hesitating when he had the ball. He w- had some pretty like not crazy high scoring games, but he's, he's making an impact offensively. He's always moving. He's always in the mix of everything. You can trust him as a secondary ball handler. So Again, like there's, it's, it's just it's a lot of things to be excited for. It's just a lot of uncertainty, and that's the thing. Like, yeah, I can say all these things. There's like none of these could happen. You know, like no one could improve. No one could be assertive. You know, so there's there's ways for them to be a lot better. There's also ways for them to just be, you know, the same old hawks, which would be disappointing. But um, with the, when guys are young, it's hard to project what they're gonna look like. So, mm-hmm. well, one thing that does really help with them developing is getting off the season to a good start. And I sent you over the Hawks' first 10 games. This is something I've been asking everyone I've been bringing on, but okay. what do you project the Hawks' record to be over the first 10? Uh, and just for our listeners, I'll mm-hmm. go ahead and read off these games, but I think I think the Hawks have a, a great chance to start off the season really strong. First, mm-hmm. first game, Brooklyn, Charlotte, at OKC, versus Washington, at Washington. Back-to-back games. First Washington, then at Washington. Sacramento Kings, New Orleans Pelicans, Boston, New York, Detroit. That's a little bit of a tough stretch with Boston, New York, okay, or uh, the Pelicans, but you got two games against Washington, a game against Brooklyn, Charlotte, and Detroit. That's five tanking teams 
or I mean, maybe not tanking, but not the best teams at least. Is what do you think the Hawks' record is going to look like after ten games? Yeah, so the Hawks have a, a reputation of losing games that they're supposed to win. Um, even last year, our season opener was against Charlotte, and we lost. And then we had like our our record against teams below five hundred was nowhere near as good as it should have been. And this has been an issue mm. for a minute. And the other thing is Trey is very like he typically starts seasons off pretty slow, and like a lot of times you'll have. Is Trey Young, is he bad? Oh, my gosh. And, and then all of a sudden he turns it on again in, in November. So with that being said, um, there's five – like there's like legitimately five free wins on the board. Brooklyn, Charlotte, Washington twice, and Detroit, those are all really bad teams. Like those, that, those are wins that you should, you should pick those up, like no questions asked. I think we're going to lose at least one of those, and it's going to be really frustrating, and it's probably going to be Washington. And then you've got I, – I feel good about them beating the Pels and the Kings. I'm – I would have been way higher on the Pels if they didn't trade for the Johnson Murray. I promise that's not hate. It's just I don't think I think they have an issue with with the way they're indexing their positions. Like the starting lineup's gonna be a mess. If CJ McCollum's starting, oh, who's gonna start at center? Is it gonna be Zion? Um way so too much I think positional overlap in New it's, it's bad. It's, just... it's really bad. They've got too many wings and they've got too many guards. So um I think we'll pick up a win against them. I think we get at least one of OKC, Boston, and New York. Um so I on August 15th, I said six and four. So I'll say six and four today as well. Uh, and that's, that's you know, I, I think that would be kind of like emblematic of the Hawks this season. Like they're going to have some really impressive wins against teams people don't think they have any chance against. But um, inevitably, they're going to probably drop some against teams they should have stomped. So uh, I think they're way better than those teams. It's just sometimes like, you know, a lot of fluctuations with the way that we play, with like a very high versatility offense at times. And then the defense, the defense should be more consistent, but there's still times where, you know, even Jalen Johnson and Bo- like Bogey, I love him. His defense is god awful mm-hmm. off the ball. He falls mm-hmm. asleep, and, but he's really he's solid as a defender if he can like play someone up, like straight up. But it's just off the ball. He's super frustrating. So all that being said, I'll say six and four. Okay, I, I like it. I I think getting off to a good start to start the year is going to be really big for the Hawks. I also just I always like looking at these things because hey, if a team gets off to a super hot start, but they played five of the probably worst teams in the league, like. I find mainstream media tends to overreact to be like, oh, are the Hawks for real? Or, oh, is this team for real? It's like, well, yeah, maybe. But it, it's also kind of just expectation. I remember a couple of years back, the Magic got off to, it was like eight and five in their first 13 games. And everyone was like, oh, the Magic. And then they ended up five, sub 500 and it was just, just a fluke of the scheduling. Um, I, I want to end with one last question here because I know I told you a half hour, we're already at 45. Um, playoffs. You said that a goal for the Hawks was to make the playoffs. I think we can lock in in the Celtics, the Bucks, the Knicks, and the 76ers. Then there's that next four that you mentioned, the Cavs, the Magic, the Pacers, and the Heat. Right. Want to start a little beef here. Pick one of those four. Who's not making it in place of the Hawks? Uh, if it would be anyone, like I think it would be the Heat and I don't know. It's just, is Jimmy Butler going to be Jimmy Butler? You know, like he hasn't really been that over the last couple of regular seasons, and I think it's cost them. Mm-hmm. I also, mm-hmm. like, I don't know how many reports I can really trust anymore, just like in terms of like player, like how players feel about their particular team. But, you know, I would imagine there's a little bit of frustration there because they've been the same team for a minute, and there hasn't really been a ton of improvement. I love the Khalil Ware pick. I love the Pell Larson pick. Both those guys, like, fit really well with what they're doing, but. I don't think they've made enough to really distinguish themselves from the other teams in the East. And they need another superhuman effort from Jimmy Butler uh, to actually make that happen. So uh, out of those guys, I'd probably say Miami. Nikola Jovic is not Nikola Jokic. He's not enough to save them. I like this. All right. Well, David, thank you so much for coming on. Love you to plug your socials. Uh, Where can the people find you? Yeah, for sure. I appreciate you having me on, Nate. Um, I'm Dealey43 on all platforms, Instagram, Twitter. YouTube, TikTok. Uh, right now, I'm doing a lot of stuff on TikTok. I'm going to be coming out with my record predictions, which is more so of a, like a thorough overview of every team. So sort of similar to what Nate is doing when he's bringing guys on for or bringing people on for the podcast. But I sort of like take a deep dive on each team to understand where they are going into the season, make my predictions. I'm going to be complementing that with a, a model I'm going to be building to sort of project their records uh, based on some individual team, individual net ratings. So we'll see how that looks. Um, but again, thank you for the opportunity. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, you guys can find me, Nate underscore Hoops Temple. 
Temple on TikTok. You can also email the show hoopstemple at gmail.com. Love to hear from you guys. Thank you for listening.